Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Eisenach. I'm a visiting scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute. Well, thank you for joining us in this Google Hangout to talk about <clears throat> the open Internet order and the fact that it's being challenged uh, in court uh, in a proceeding in which the oral argument will take place on Monday, September 9th. The open Internet order was issued by the Federal Communications Commission in 2010 and it imposes a far-reaching far regulatory regime on Internet service providers and, and arguably others in the Internet ecosystem. The issues before the court on Monday are as diverse as whether the Federal Communications Commission can uh, regulate free speech over the Internet uh, and whether its authority extends not just to telecommunications providers uh, but beyond telecommunications providers to the entire Internet ecosystem. Uh, when you listen to the debate about this issue, you'll hear a lot of claims being made. Uh, a lot of them are claims that don't comport very well with the facts uh, and uh, have to do with the nature of the Internet system today and the way it got that way. Uh, the experts that you're going to hear from today uh, are experts who are going to try to put all of this in context uh, based on the facts and, and on the law. Uh, and describe both the uh, import of this uh, court decision and uh, the implications depending on how the court uh, decides it going forward. Uh, we have four speakers today and I'm going to turn the uh, panel over to the, uh, the microphone and the, the uh, uh, video over to them in just a second. Uh, in order, uh, they are first Richard Bennett. Richard is uh, an Information uh, Technology and Innovation Foundation Senior Fellow specializing in broadband networking and internet policy. Uh, Richard is the engineer in the group and ironically the one of us who's not been able to get his uh, Google Hangout uh, camera working effectively so Richard I think may appear as small and round and in a cameo uh, as he speaks with us today but I think we are going to be able to hear his, hear his voice. Uh, secondly, someone that many people uh, participating in this uh, already know well, uh, Robert McDowell is a visiting fellow at the Hudson Institute, a former commission of, commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission from 2006 to 2013. Uh, prior to that, he was president and assistant general counsel of Comtel uh, and has been an active participation in telecommunications and internet policy. Uh, policy making over the course of, of many years. We're delighted to have Rob with us. Um, thirdly, um, uh, Daniel Lyons is an assistant professor at Boston College Law School. He specializes in the areas of property, telecommunications, and administrative law. Before joining the faculty, Lyons practiced energy, telecommunications, and administrative law at the firm of Munger, Tolles, and Olson. And he's clerked for Judge Cynthia Holcomb Hall of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, finally, uh, wrapping up our speakers, Babette Bullock is an assistant professor at Pepperdine University Law School of Law. And before Pepperdine, many of us, uh, many of you know, uh, she served as a senior fellow at the Information Economy Project at George Mason University School of Law uh, and a fellow at the Center for Communication Law and Policy, uh, which is a joint research ven venture of the University of Southern California Law School and Annenberg School of Communication. Um, before we go further, let me mention that um, many of the people on uh, on this Hangout may have noticed already and we hope you'll be noticing in the future that there's a lot going on at the American Enterprise Institute these days when it comes to technology policy. Uh, the uh, increase in our activity is going to be continuing and we're, we hope you'll notice that even more over the course of the next few weeks. We've got some exciting announcements uh, coming in terms of activities that we're going to be undertaking going forward uh, and um, which we're all very excited about. Uh, for now, the best way to uh, keep apprised of all of those things, if you're not already on our mailing list, I think you can subscribe to that probably on the page for this event. Uh, but the easiest way to do it would be to simply follow uh, at AEI Tech on uh, Twitter. It's at AEI Tech is the handle. Uh, A-E-I-T-E-C-H on Twitter. Uh, you'll find that we're already tweeting uh, on a daily basis, multiple tweets a day. We hope they're of interest. Uh, and we invite you to join our community through through that vehicle and to be on the alert for more news to come. So with, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to turn the floor, as it were, over to Richard Bennett. Uh, and Richard is going to talk, uh, provide kind of some broad context here uh, 
about the history of the internet, how it's gotten to be what it is today, and the impact of this uh, pretty dramatic increase in regulatory uh, oversight uh, proposed by the FCC on innovation going forward. Richard, uh, please uh, take the mic. Yeah, I think uh, I, I hope everybody can hear me, and it's. Uh, I'm sorry that you can't see my picture. My video camera thinks it's working, but you know, I guess Google must be blocking me and violating my net neutrality. <laughs> um, couldn't be my fault, after all. I, I, I listened to a uh, panel discussion at the New America Foundation just a little while ago about this court case, and, and I was kind of astonished to hear people still making the same basic factual errors about the net neutrality regulations that they made in the very beginning when, when the uh, infamous Comcast case was before the FCC and people failed to realize what was actually going on from Comcast's point of view is that they were trying to protect the quality of service that their Vonage users had on their networks when neighbors were using a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file transfer software were using BitTorrent basically. And, and so if you characterize this debate as something that has to do with the desire of uh, broadband service providers to have monopoly control over a network so they can sell more video products to consumers and ignore the fact that there are still unresolved uh, management problems with the, the Internet's basic architecture, then you kind of miss uh, a really essential element of the debate. Because basically what the net neutrality as a, as a broad concept leaving aside the FCC's authority and the specifics of the FCC's rules for a second. As a broad concept, net neutrality says that the Internet, as it operated, as it has operated historically, is the way it should always operate in the future. So whatever the status quo is on the Internet at the time that these particular rules were drafted, you know, should be the status quo for the future with certain very narrow exceptions. So if anyone wants to deviate, from the traditional way of managing internet services and, uh, in, and in fact deviate from the standard internet protocols, they have to make a really, the burden of proof is on them to convince the commission that what they're doing serves a legitimate purpose and is not simply uh, predatory. So I, I think that that assumption uh, from a technical standpoint really bothers me because I don't really think the Internet is, is the best of all possible networks and certainly the, the architectural understanding and the, and the applications mix that was prevalent in the 1980s is not what we have today. And there's certainly a, the conflict between the requirements that, uh, that applications like Vonage and other VoIP services have um, with the patterns of consumption that you see in file transfer oriented and web surfing oriented applications, that hasn't gone away. That's still a very sharp conflict. And as the FCC undertakes the IP transition considerations, you know, that's going to come to light. And it shouldn't be necessary to build an entirely separate network to run voice over IP in order to get quality of service. And I think that's, that's the, the troubling thing from, from a technology standpoint. Is we know that applications don't all have the same requirements. And the uh, extent to which an application can be successful running over a network in which the application and the network are now separate things, which wasn't the case in the PSTN days, that really depends on the ability of the network to adapt itself to the requirements that different applications have. You know, some applications like voice need to have very low latency. Other applications that want to transfer massive amounts of data need to simply have low cost for uh, large amounts of data and they're not sensitive to latency. So these issues are unresolved. Uh, we don't really have a good engineering solution to that. We need the, the freedom for technologists to experiment with these things and business plans uh, are definitely going to be part of the solution, I think, you know, as, as uh, we go forward and figure out how to harmonize uh, the various applications that people want to run across modern broadband networks. So there's an assumption that's built into the specific drafting of the FCC's rules that deviation is suspect. And that if that assumption were turned around where there's inherently a freedom to experiment subject to a sort of post hoc, I think that's the term that you uh, lawyers use, uh, oversight, then, you know, we in the first instance, I think uh, the broadband service providers would be less nervous about offering new services uh, 
that actually allowed uh, internet-based video and voice services to be more competitive with the uh, services that the ISPs offer bundled into their triple play packages. So there's a negative impact on innovation from, from regulating in the wrong way. And there's, and there's a positive impact, I think, on innovation from regulating in the right way, and the right way being something that's essentially permissive uh, with uh, oversight after the fact. And that's, that's kind of what I think we need to, we need to drive toward. Um, I, I don't, the, the legal, I'm sure the rest of you guys can, can address the legal niceties a, a, a whole lot better than, than I ever could, but I mean, I think there is a there is something to be said about the fact that since these rules were enacted by the FCC, there really hasn't been a single formal complaint. There was one informal complaint that had to do with terms of service on Google's broadband uh, product in Kansas City, but uh, it hasn't really become a formal complaint. It was, uh, I think, just a fairly frivolous uh, issue that somebody wanted to raise to embarrass Google. But you know what we have seen is a movement in other countries around the world to I expand government oversight and revenue extraction opportunities from the from broadband services and from the internet in terms of things like Wicket. And you know I don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, and finally, I think I'd close by saying you know that there there is an assumption that I think I, I heard from from some of the net neutrality advocates at the NAF event to the effect that the United States has second-class networks? Really? I mean, that's, real, that's an astonishing claim, because in particular, our mobile broadband networks are the envy of the world. We're the most widely deployed with LTE of any country. And if you look at the, at the, ex, at the extensiveness of our broadband services, the speeds that they offer, and the adoption, where virtually 95% of, according to the to Pew, 95% of Americans aged 18 to 25 use broadband at home. It's really difficult to see that there's any empirical basis for saying that we have second-class networks that, you know, can somehow need to be improved by more massive regulation. It seems to me that the system is basically working pretty well. Thanks. Well, Richard, thank you very much, and let me uh, turn the, the podium now over to uh, former Commissioner Robert McDowell. Rob? Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thanks for having me here today. It's uh, good to be with such a distinguished group, and I actually, I'd like to pick up right where Richard left off. He uh, left with a great uh, segue there, uh, which is, uh, you know, the Internet uh, was thriving before the Open Internet Order of 2010, and it's uh, thriving after um, and if you look at the marketplace or let's look at uh, the deployment of broadband facilities, in 2003, only about 15% of Americans had uh, access to a broadband network. By the end of 2009, six years later, 95% of Americans had access to a broadband provider. Uh, and of course, we want more. We want more competition, and that's happening, as Richard pointed out in the wireless space. We have wireless broadband as the fastest growing component of the uh, broadband market. And that's no coincidence in that wireless has been lightly regulated. Uh, from 03 to 09, there was no national broadband plan by the government. Uh, this was the private sector. In fact, the FCC was trying to make it clear that it would not step in uh, to regulating the broadband internet access space uh, like a uh, wireline, analog, voice monopoly from 1934, which is what uh, the foundation of uh, a lot of these regulations come from. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So the whole point being is that we had a robust internet thanks to the private sector, and we had uh, the multi-stakeholder internet governance model. And I'll get back to that here in just a few minutes. Um, as you may know, I uh, dissented very strongly against uh, the FCC's uh, 2010 open internet order, just as I did in the Comcast Goods Bank. Uh, case in 08, um, and for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost was I felt the FCC did not have uh, the legal authority to do what it did, and I think the good professor is going to talk more about that. We can um, comment on that some more. Um, but uh, you know, right behind that, there was no uh, nothing broken to be, to be fixed uh, by the government. Uh, the best that the proponents could do were to point to about roughly, almost literally a handful of isolated cases, all 
that were all resolved um, through other means, other than uh, creating a new regulatory regime. Um, and I, I think that's uh, important to note. Um, the FCC also never conducted a bona fide peer-reviewed market study, actually any market study whatsoever, of the broadband internet. And perhaps that would be because it would show what the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, found unanimously on a bipartisan basis in 2007 when it examined broadband internet access uh, in that market. And it concluded that uh, there was no anti-competitive conduct uh, going on. And it also warned against the government uh, stepping into this space with ex-ante regulation uh, precisely because of the unintended consequences and costs that almost invariably uh, arise um, as a result of regulation, especially when it's new law, a new type of regulation. So nothing was broken. Uh, the internet access market uh, was thriving. Uh, the FCC didn't have the, the legal authority. Um, and for those who are arguing today the FCC does have the legal authority to do uh, what it did, at least under Title I, uh, as it did in the BitTorrent case, I would I would really uh, respond by saying, if the commission already had the authority, why in 07 and 08 did Congress uh, try to pass laws uh, giving the FCC uh, the authority to issue uh, net neutrality rules? Um, that, of course, that legislation ultimately failed. But if the FCC already had that authority, why was it necessary to pass uh, a new law? Now, why did the DC Circuit vehemently uh, disagree with that um, in April 2010? Uh, so those are all points to me. Um, another point I want to make is that when it comes to the law, another reason for my dissent, uh, and there were many, it was a very long dissent, I apologize to all of them, I'll read all the way through it, but um, it was that other laws already exist to protect consumers. And this argument gets ignored um, by proponents of new regulation. Um, if an internet service provider is acting in an anti-competitive way, there are a number of legal arrows in the government's quiver uh, to combat that. Uh, there is certainly antitrust law. There are consumer protection laws. The Federal Trade Commission, I think, has ample authority to protect consumers in this way, just the way it does uh, in other contexts, any other industry. Uh, there are tortious interference with contract type laws. I think the plaintiff's bar would have a field day um, the class action disputes, and one was brought against LCN actually in a similar way years ago. Uh, but they would have a field day uh, if there were market failure um, under a variety of uh, claims, I'm sure, and breach of contract claims. Um, there are state consumer protection laws, there are federal consumer protection laws. Um, and all of these can be used uh, to guard against those are feared uh, anti competitive conduct that the proponents uh, try to raise. This is the, the fear is what they raise rather than pointing to uh, actual market failure. So uh, keep that in mind. And then also to pick up on a point that, that Richard made, he's absolutely right, and I tried to warn against this back in, well, in 08 really, uh, was the government stepping into this space really crosses a regulatory rubric uh, of allowing governments to step into this space all over the globe. Um, and the internet has grew into what it is today, this global network of networks without borders, uh, with intelligence built in every step of the way, um, because it was lightly regulated. And it grew so quickly precisely because of a lack of government barriers there. Um, and when you discard the non-governmental, multi-stakeholder model uh, that helped it continue to run um, and, and prosper, uh, then you start to politicize decisions that are really better made by engineers. Um, and that, unfortunately, um, is what is happening more and more. Uh, and I think the FCC, I think, I know, the FCC's uh, order uh, has given a lot of cover and fuel to international efforts to regulate the net. I know this because I was at the Wicked in Dubai. Uh, I was part of the official communication. I was in the bilateral one-on-one -on -one meeting between the U.S. and other governments where the private sector was not allowed to be, just government, um, government principles. Excuse me. And um, this issue came up time and time again uh, from representatives of other countries that were proponents 
of having the ITU um, economically regulate um, the net in all aspects. Um, and it's not just internet service providers, it's you know, content companies as well. Which also raises another point, and I'll start to wrap up here in a minute. Um, I'm going to describe to you a company, um, and you can tell me which uh, company it is. It has thousands of miles of fiber that go all over the globe. That fiber connects routers and servers everywhere, and this company offers voice, video, and data services. Now, is that company Verizon? Is it Microsoft? Is it at and Or is it Google? And, of course, the answer is all of the above, and there are a lot of other companies that could have listed. Um, and what this shows is consumer demand and innovation is causing tremendously wonderful convergence. Uh, it is uh, very difficult to uh, figure out what a internet service provider is, or a backbone provider, uh, or a content company or application provider. Because, and I'll defer to Richard on this. When you start diagramming these networks and uh, what they look like on a whiteboard, let's say, they're going to look a lot alike. And these are arguments that are being made at the ITU uh, for regulating the whole lot of them. Uh, and uh, trying to drive money for local treasuries, local national treasuries throughout the world, and many other things. So what this does, how this actually boils down to affecting consumers, is it has the perverse effect of not protecting them, but of actually creating uncertainty uh, and raising costs, which ultimately might make things that are free on the internet and not free anymore, or squelching innovation. And what's hard to measure, what's very difficult to measure, uh, when it comes to the unintended consequences of government action, is what did not come to market as a result of that action. A couple other quick points. Um, I have long proposed, going back, I think, to 07 or 08, uh, during the beginning of the Comcast Bitcoin uh, controversy, that there be a different way to address these concerns, that the proponents of new laws and new regulations could use the multi-stakeholder model, the non-governmental multi-stakeholder model, but give governments a seat at the table, at the non-governmental table, not having government give seats uh, to the uh, internet governance community at the government table. So the government could sit down with the academics, the engineers, the user groups, civil society, and when there are bona fide allegations of anti-competitive conduct, these groups could spotlight them. And that sunlight is a magnificent uh, deterrent. Uh, then the government can uh, put on the table its legal arrows, the ones I just described earlier, and use those. Uh, and that's going to also be the thing. But another thing that will be the thing is more competition in the last mile. Uh, and the rise of wireless broadband in particular creates, is already creating, a tremendous disruptive effect. Uh, and from an economic perspective uh, and, a, and from a consumer's perspective, these are wonderful things. That provides a check and a balance. We'll get uh, later to uh, other things go to the other side on the First Amendment issues. I don't think the court's going to go there uh, because the statutory claims are so ripe for the picking and courts are very reluctant to uh, rule on the constitutionality of uh, government action unless it has no choice. Uh, and a few other things because I think I've overset my time. So, Dr. Eisenach, that's <laughs> Commissioner, thank you so much. Uh, and let's just go straight to Daniel Lyons uh, up in Boston. Uh, Daniel, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. And actually, let's pick up right where the commissioner left off, right? Let's focus on uh, exactly what arguments are going to be playing out uh, in court on Monday. The big legal question, right, is whether the FCC has jurisdiction to regulate uh, broadband providers. I want to set that aside for the moment. And I want to talk briefly about the other legal arguments that Verizon is making. So I think they're interesting ones. Uh, but before we can get into that, we sort of have to understand what exactly the order does, right? So for wireline broadband providers, the order puts three basic requirements on them. One is a requirement of transparency. Whatever their network practices are, they need to be open and disclose that to, to customers. Secondly, uh, there a no blocking rule. They can't block uh, lawful content coming in over the internet, content or applications. And third, no, they're not allowed to engage in, there's a, a pro prohibition on unreasonable discrimination in the flow of content and applications over the internet. Right, it's an interesting choice of words, this unreasonable discrimination. Uh, it's a phrase that's not sort of plucked from thin air, it, it's uh, 
legal term of art that has a long history in regulated utilities law. Right? It sort of invokes the essence of common carriage, the notion that an entity that's burdened with such a requirement has to provide service to all interested con customers um, on uniform terms. Right, so I want to touch on, uh, set that aside now and uh, touch on it in just a couple of minutes. The order itself does not explain what uh, the commission means by unreasonable discrimination in this context, except that it says that it would likely preclude paid prioritization agreements, right? Um, and it means that broadband providers cannot favor their own content over the content of uh, other non-affiliated providers. Now, the order makes exceptions for reasonable network management and for specialized services, but it doesn't really describe what either of those are either. On the wireless side, the restrictions are a little bit less onerous, right? There's a requirement that you can't block websites and that you can't block applications that compete with the broadband provider's own voice or video app. All right, so with that as a background, let's talk about Verizon's first statutory argument. Um, Verizon is arguing essentially that the network, the net neutrality order imposes a common carriage regime on broadband, and that's a problem because the Communications Act explicitly prohibits the FCC from imposing uh, common carriage on non-telecommunication services, right? So the Act says that the FCC can impose common carriage on uh, telecommunication services, but not on information services. And earlier in the 2000s, we thought that the FCC decided and the Supreme Court upheld the notion that broadband falls in the latter category. It's an information service. Uh, in order to build, so the takeaway from that argument is that if it's an information service and not a telecommunication service, it cannot, under statute, uh, be treated at, with common carriage obligations. In order to build this argument, uh, Verizon is building on an old case from the 1970s called Midwest Video. And the Midwest Video story is great because it shows that everything old is new again, right? So back in the 1970s, the FCC is faced with the, the question, how do we regulate this grand, brand new technology that we've never dealt with before uh, and we don't necessarily have explicit statutory authority for. And in that case, it was cable. And the FCC wanted to regulate cable in a number of different ways. One thing they wanted to do was to require cable companies to dedicate channels to people who wanted to use the cable system to talk to cable customers. Um, and so the requirement essentially said, we have to leave some channels available on a first-come, first-served basis. And there were other rules about the fee that could be charged in order to use those channels. And the cable companies took the case up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, that sounds an awful lot like common carriage, right? And when you're requiring a provider to carry the traffic of uh, any and all comers, uh, and you're regulating the rates at which they can do so, that sounds a lot like common carriage. And just like com uh, common carriage was uh, prohibited in that context, said the Supreme Court. The FCC is suggesting, or the, I'm sorry, Verizon is suggesting that the FCC is doing the same thing here. What net neutrality is doing is requiring broadband providers to dedicate space in their network for third parties to come and talk to their customers. And in fact, is setting, not just regulating the rate at which they can charge for that, but setting a rate of zero, right? Saying they cannot charge at all any content or application provider for that service. Now, uh, the FCC's response to this argument has essentially been, this isn't common carriage because we're not affecting Verizon's ability to decide which end users they're dealing with, right? which customers they want or not. But it's important to note that that wasn't an issue really in Midwest Video either. right? The cable restriction was not regulating who cable could and could not hire, uh, could, not, could or could not enlist as customers. It was affecting people wanting to use the network to speak to those customers. And so the analogy is a very strong one. Uh, beyond that, uh, Verizon has also made a pair of constitutional arguments. I tend to agree I don't think the courts are going to get there, but they're worth flagging uh, really briefly. First of all, uh, Verizon is claiming that the net neutrality order restricts their First Amendment rights. Right, so the Supreme Court has long held that the First Amendment freedom of speech extends not just to speakers, but also to those who facilitate the speak of uh, the speech of others. 
because they engage in editorial discretion regarding who does and does not get to speak over their media. So we can go back to again to the cable uh, industry. We had a dispute in the 1990s, a court split 5-4 on how much First Amendment protection to give to cable providers. But the uh, justices agreed 9 nothing that the First Amendment extended to someone like cable that doesn't speak itself but uses its network in order to allow others to speak. Right. And so if in fact net neutrality is limiting the First Amendment editorial control rights of broadband providers, then the government has to satisfy intermediate scrutiny in order for it to succeed. Intermediate scrutiny would require the FCC to show that the uh, regulation at issue serves an important governmental interest and that it's not burdening substantially more speech than necessary to achieve that interest. And in this case Verizon is saying there's no important governmental interest in here because there's no real evidence of a problem. Right? There's no actual evidence that uh, the internet is anything less than open uh, and therefore there's no important governmental interest to be pursued by a law that would require it. And then secondly, that the uh, net neutrality order is both over and under inclusive in order to solve any particular problems with uh, delivery of internet traffic. It's over inclusive in that it burdens all broadband providers, requires them to provide access to everyone regardless of whether there's an actual problem, an actual demonstrated problem. And it's under inclusive in that it doesn't address other areas of potential bottlenecks in the internet ecosystem, such as search engines, right? Uh, and then finally, the uh, Verizon is making the argument that requiring them to open up their networks to uh, private entities to speak against their will violates their Fifth Amendment rights and constitutes a taking, uh, which I think is a, a very interesting argument. I don't think the courts are going to get there because uh, Verizon only really dedicated a paragraph to it. Um, but I think ultimately, right, neither of these First Amendment and Fifth or Fifth Amendment arguments has to be airtight in order to have an effect on the proceeding, because there's a canon of interpretation that suggests that if a um, constitutional question is fairly presented, then the court must choose the outcome in the case that does that does not raise constitutional concerns. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Verizon wins on the First Amendment claim. The fact that the regulation suggests is suggesting a uh, that might raise First Amendment or Fifth Amendment problems is enough to suggest that the FCC ought to go back to the drawing board and not proceed any further without getting statutory approval, clear statutory approval from Congress. So that's all I have. I want to turn it over uh, now and see if we can go forward with uh, the more interesting legal questions here. <laughs> Well, uh, we are going to turn it over to Babette. Um, I do want to mention that we've gotten a couple questions from folks who are uh, reviewing us online. Uh, and for if you pin the question, uh, we're going to turn to those just as soon as Babette uh, finishes her uh, opening remarks, which uh, which about eight or ten minutes. So um, uh, if you put in a question, be patient. We'll be uh, we'll be right back with you in about eight or ten minutes. Uh, but Babette, uh, in the meantime, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, everybody. Uh, the great thing about going last on such a great panel is that I don't have to add very much. Uh, so I can keep the remarks short and carry off of what Daniel was saying about the actual case that we're looking at. Uh, uh, he's touched briefly on what the main argument is going to be a jurisdictional argument. And that's going to involve whether or not we merely have the jurisdiction to support the rules uh, he described. And that comes down, uh, first off, to the statutory argument that he outlined, uh, which is that, in, at the moment, all broadband connections are categorized under what's ca called Title I of the Act. And under Title I, they are officially information services, not telecommunication services. And so, therefore, uh, as Daniel alluded to, if what we're looking at if the rules are actually common carrier rules. Uh, in other words, they're rules that are best described under Title II. You can't transport the Title I jurisdiction into Title II because Congress has expressly prohibited that. Uh, so that's the first volley, if you will, of Verizon, that this is a type of uh, 
a regulation which is being misdescribed as Title I, it's actually Title II, and that should be prohibited because we are officially Title I. So, of course, the FCC's argument on that is not to, is to characterize it differently and say, continue with the Title I. Uh, it needs then, because it's acting under what's called ancillary jurisdiction, in other words, it's not uh, direct, but needs to uh, be supported by functions that the FCC has been statutorily mandated uh, to provide rules and regulations for. So it needs to find something in the statute to tether the orders to. And of course, it won't tether it to the Title II prohibited uh, statutes. So they've come with some other statutes, various statutes uh, that uh, uh, you find throughout the Act. And some of them uh, have already been dealt with in a prior case com called Comcast, which was alluded to by Richard. And uh, in that, Comcast was uh, found to be acting against an earlier version of policy statement, very akin to the rules we're dealing with now. And they were found to be, uh, by, uh, uh, or alleged to be violating them by the FCC. And they challenged uh, the fine that they were given by the FCC. And we're in the D.C. Circuit, where Verizon, the FCC, of course, is going to be held again. In that case, uh, the FCC also asserted its ancillary jurisdiction under Title I and said, for example, for support that uh, various provisions like 706 would support it. Well, the, the circuit spoke very strongly, saying that they did not find that there was specific support for the rules under the provisions enumerated by the FCC finding them, more often than not, policy statements which could not support the, quote, uh, congressional tether to the actions that uh, the FCC was attempting to do. Again, the attempt is not for the agency to be bereft of power, but to be given the power that was duly delegated to them by Congress. And when you're dealing with the ancillary jurisdiction, all the more so that you want to be very careful to tether it to the congressional mandate. And they failed to do that in Comcast, and, and that is one of the things they're repeating in Verizon v. FCC, the same sort of statutory support. So it doesn't seem like much has changed in their Title I argument. Uh, with one exception, they have added uh, some support for perhaps wireless broadband and acting uh, rules out for wireless broadband. Specifically, the powers that come from to the FCC, their power to give out the licenses for spectrum that wireless needs to operate. So there might be a divergence there between the treatment of wireless versus wireline. But the Title I argument for um, or at least the landline, seems not to have changed extensively since Comcast when the D.C. Circuit first saw it and uh, uh, dismissed it as not being uh, sufficiently supportive of the order. So I, I tend to believe that we might see a repeat of that at least when we get to the landline, that the Title I argument will will uh, perhaps come up short. So the second question of interest might be if jurisdiction is not found, uh, of course it could be, no one knows for the court, but if it is not found uh, under Title I, what's, what's the next game plan? What's the next, uh, where do we go from there? And I want to say first and foremost, to pick up on the commissioner's comment, what doesn't happen is chaos. That does not happen. What happens merely is that you are left to a highly supervised, uh, free market, innovative, uh, um, uh, competitive arena. Uh, which is closely guarded by the many entities articulated by the commissioner. 
including the FTC, which I also agree has extensive power for consumer protection. Uh, what might happen by those who are very eager for these particular rules to go through is there is a push perhaps to, uh, to just change the classification from the problematic Title I information services to the common carrier Title II. Uh, to the extent this is allowed, and there are arguments that it, it, it will be allowed if the FCC reclassifies it, that the court will view that with great uh, deference, and that uh, suddenly we could find broadband interconnection as a common carrier. Uh, then they could point directly to the common carrier provisions that have been talked about previously. That, of course, has its own problems. Uh, we've done common carrier regulation before. We have done rate regulation before. Uh, we do have uh, strong empirical evidence from, from many years of trying that with less than um, uh, hopeful consumer welfare results. Uh, it, it, we do have a dampening of investment for innovation when great regulation is in play. We do have an increase in uncertainty. So that comes down to the policy side of whether we would want to do that or not. Uh, I would also note that Title II has a very special uh, side effect that many people have not focused on, is that under Title II regulation, the FTC loses its jurisdiction. There is a carve-out for common carriers where the FTC must step back from where uh, the regulator has directly spoken. I think this is an incredible loss to consumers because the, the FTC's jurisdiction, when it's not a common carrier, is plenary. So to the extent we're dealing with competitive issues, then it's irrelevant that Google and Verizon looks the same because the FTC can uh, look at them all equally and treat them equally. Well, the FCC is going to struggle a bit more uh, to fit uh, particular elephants into the regulatory whole. So that's a side effect that should be carefully considered before any Title II uh, sort of regulation. Uh, and with that, I think I'll just leave it and open it up to further comment. Well, Babette, uh, thank you, and thank you to all four of you for, I think, uh, teeing these issues up uh, just extremely well. And um, I've got a couple of things that I want to get into myself, but before I do that, we've had a couple questions. Uh, and the first one of those um, goes to the question that, that we've touched on just briefly, but I want to give particularly our uh, attorneys, uh, uh, Rob and Daniel and Babette, an opportunity to address specifically. And, and it, it goes to, I think, some comments that Susan Crawford uh, made earlier today at an event sponsored by the New America Foundation where she was referring to uh, the possibility that uh, I, I understand that um, uh, that if the court were to rule against the Commission on First Amendment grounds, uh, that the upshot of that uh, could be that there was no um, authority even for Congress uh, to step in and remake uh, the net neutrality rules. Uh, and I guess my question particularly to the three lawyers is A, you know, do you think that's correct, and, and B, uh, how much hard time would you give that, would, would, would that give you if that were the case? Can I jump in on that real quick? Please, Rob. Why don't we go in order, Rob, Daniel, and then Babette? Okay, well, whatever you want to do. Um, so, uh, first of all, as was said before by uh, others, I don't think the First Amendment claims will be reached by the court. I don't think it will need to. Courts are very reluctant to reach constitutional claims uh, when there are uh, statutory provisions that are so easy, so they've got targets in this case. Um, what's interesting here is, uh, uh, you, being in your question, you may not have intended to do this, but to say, let's leave it to the lawyer, essentially. Uh, so we have Susan Crawford, who uh, I respect to tremendously disagree with, also tremendously sometimes, but in respect, um, and um, it has a, a very uh, great legal norm. Um, we have lawyers involved. Uh, here we are lawyering up the Internet, um, and as uh, just an optical matter, let alone the practicalities of that, that's the wrong direction to go in. We need more engineers uh, involved in this space, not more lawyers involved in this space. But um, to her point directly, uh, should the court reach the First Amendment grounds, uh, that does not bar the Commission, uh, or Congress rather, from 
uh, trying to act um, in, a, in ways that help consumers. But keep in mind also that there are those laws that are already in existence to protect consumers. Um, this also speaks to a whole other topic we could talk about another day, which is the need to rewrite uh, America's communications laws to make them look more like competition and more consumer protection law. So look at everything through the lens of a consumer rather than what legacy technology something is being delivered over, uh, which is how the stovepipe laws exist today. So Congress, if it wanted to, would still have plenty of authority in this um, area, but it doesn't need to. The whole premise of, uh, of the proponents' um, discussion and their ideas is flawed in that A, there's no problem, and B, there are laws already on the books to protect consumers. Daniel? Yeah, I think it, it's a bit of an overreach to say that um, the court's uh, validating of Verizon's First Amendment rights would necessarily preclude any type of regulation in this area. I actually think uh, the First Amendment jurisprudence is simply doesn't uh, lend itself to either or solutions like that. Rather, what it, what it would suggest is that if Congress decides that this is an important enough issue that it needs to start treading on the speech rights of broadband providers, the court's going to put it to its metal and make sure that uh, you're not infringing any more than necessary on the rights protected by the First Amendment. So I hinted at a little bit earlier, right, that the proper test here is probably intermediate scrutiny, uh, which means that whatever Congress decides to do, uh, the courts are going to make sure that uh, the purpose of the regulation is serving an important governmental interest and that the regulation itself is not burdening any more speech than necessary in order to pursue that important governmental interest. So it's not saying that Congress can do nothing, it's just making sure that Congress doesn't act unless we know that it's pursuing something really important, important enough that we're silencing some part of our uh, electorate, right? And that it's not treading on speech any more than it has to. Which is a far cry, I think, from, making, from saying Congress can't do anything, it's just making sure that uh, Congress justifies what it's doing and uh, its justification is sound in the eyes of the court. Uh, I, I, I agree with the uh, two part speakers, obviously. Uh, I agree with the commissioner in that it, it, it's a sad state of affairs when we lawyer up the internet, although as a law professor, maybe I should be happy about the increased demand it will create. <laughs> but as a consumer, I'm uh, frustrated by it. And I still do think it's, it's a it's a bit of an overstatement to say the least that uh, we're suddenly going to be tramp, uh, trampling on the ability of Congress to pass a new law. Um, uh, that would have to be put in, in much tighter context to, to, to be understandable. Yes, it might reach uh, higher scrutiny if we reach this issue at all. Uh, and, uh, but again, uh, that would mean that we're protecting someone else's First Amendment rights as according to the court. Thank you. Well, I want to circle back to Richard here and, and um, Richard kind of engage you in a, a, a dialogue or I'll throw out a, a premise and a couple ideas and then ask for your reaction. Um, and it goes to the question of whether there's a problem here in the first place. So when, when I listen to uh, net neutrality advocates, uh, first of all, I hear a lot of discussion about issues that don't seem to me to be in any way related to net neutrality questions. Uh, so the extent of broadband availability in rural America uh, or whether the U.S. is first in the world or fifth in the world or 15th in the world and, and broadband networks, um, you know, I think we would agree that, that the U.S. is uh, a pretty robust broadband, broadband networks, both wireline and certainly wireless, that, that compare well with anybody in the world. Um, but, uh, but those issues just don't, don't seem to be on point, but there, there's a kind of sky is falling aspect to, to some of that advocacy that somehow the net neutrality order is going to improve Americans' access to broadband. Uh, so let's set those aside for a second and, and come to what I think are some of the more, um, at least hypothetically or theoretically interesting uh, questions, and that is the extent to which broadband providers uh, might have incentives and uh, to, to cut off uh, speech either for uh, First Amendment reasons or for uh, competitive reasons. Uh, so the, the assertion on the First Amendment argument is that broadband providers would seek out speech with which they disagree uh, and cut off some speech so that uh, uh, this uh, unpopular points of view would be screened out. 
Uh, and so this is kind of the reverse side of the First Amendment argument. Uh, my own perspective on that is I, I just don't see that as having happened. Uh, it seems to me that uh, if a broadband provider were to start trying to censor speech, that the feedback uh, it would get from consumers and from the world at large would be pretty powerful uh, and pretty instantaneous. I think there's one very obscure instance of that that had to do with somebody at uh, one of the phone companies mistakenly not allowing a, a, a public interest group to create a, a online, uh, excuse me, a wireless uh, chat group. Um, uh, which got got, uh, got uh, uh, fixed pretty quickly without any government intervention. So I don't think there doesn't seem to me that there's any evidence of that or much likelihood of that ever occurring. Uh, people want to be able to talk to each other, and it seems to me the broadband providers have an incentive to facilitate that. And that brings us to the competitive uh, issue. Uh, and it does seem to me that in theory that one could make an argument that broadband providers might have incentives uh, in the abstract to cut off. Uh, or to disadvantage uh, competing services coming coming over their networks. Uh, but when I look at that ar argument, uh, I look at the reality of the world both before and after the open internet order. Uh, and first of all, I don't see any difference. Before the internet order, open internet order, I saw a lot of traffic that was arguably competing with services being provided by the broadband providers, uh, traveling over the broadband providers' networks. Uh, and after the open internet order, uh, I still see uh, that traffic occurring. Uh, I see Netflix, I see Hulu. Uh, for example, offering video services, which are clearly um, competing with the uh, services being offered by the cable companies and the wireline telephone companies, uh, uh, and yet that traffic is, in fact, being carried uh, by the ISPs uh, without interference. There don't seem to be any substantive complaints that have been brought up under the open internet or uh, that uh, would uh, that would even suggest that such those competitive concerns. Uh, have any validity. So, so Richard, it's a long question, obviously, but I wanted to take a second and get some of those concepts on the table and then ask you, based on uh, all of the work you've done on this, uh, you know, whether, whether you see uh, kind of a problem to be solved in the first instance. Well, th that is a complex question with a, with a lot of parts <laughs> to it. Uh, let, let's start with a couple of straightforward observations. The um, do Americans have access to competitive broadband services across the country? And for the most part, the answer to that is yes. That uh, over 90% of Americans have access to more than one wireline service. And they're not always of, uh, certainly not of equivalent speed, but uh, in, we're in the mid 80s in terms of, of access to services that meet the FCC's uh, uh, definition of a, a wireline broadband service. Wireline broadband services, however, the uh, DSL is you know criticized as being substandard, but LTE uh, offers uh, as a the mobile broadband service offers higher speeds than DSL does. There's a, a bit of an issue with the equivalency of LTE to wireline broadband because LTE is mobile and wireline broadband is not, so it's therefore an inferior service. Oh, wait a minute. I said that the wrong way. Uh, there are data caps on LTE services uh, in the mobile context, which uh, it would have to be relieved in order for it to be a fully equivalent uh, competitor to wired broadband and certainly in rural areas which is where you find less choice than we have in suburban and, ur and urban areas but that's simply a business plan issue and I think uh, freeing up more spectrum for licensed use will help to uh, to accelerate the deployment of those kinds of business plans and certainly these companies do compete with each other the uh, fiber-based DSL services that AT&T and Quest offer now are adding customers faster than cable broadband is adding customers, so they haven't gone away. AT&T U-verse service has the highest JD Power customer satisfaction ratings of any broadband service in America, so it's not something to be sneered at. So from a deployment standpoint, you know, we're certainly not uh, there, there's not, in general, a, a, a lack of choice for consumers. So you have the competitive pressure there on, on broadband suppliers, which is going to really, I think, continue to discourage them from arbitrarily blocking access to other services. But to bring it down to something real essential, Netflix has more customers than Comcast or any of the other broadband service providers do. 
So clearly Netflix has not suffered, even though, you know, the content that Netflix offers, with the exception of a few original series that they paid for themselves, is basically TV reruns, which are not, you know, inherently all that fascinating. So I think that that marketplace is doing well. All right. Um, and Richard, I you, you didn't mention one other provider that I find, you know, tends to get left out of these discussions. So I'm, I'm often hearing people say, you know, well, there are X million Americans who don't have access to any broadband services at all. Uh, and of course, unless you live, you know, at the very bottom of a very tall mountain, you have access to Viasat. Uh, services which are providing 16 megabits of downstream connectivity, 4 megabits of upstream right. connectivity, according to the FCC. I think that's $79 uh, a month and um, uh, covers virtually 100% uh, of the country. Those speeds, by the way, are faster than the highest average broadband speeds of any country in the world. They're faster than Singapore, they're faster than Seoul, they're faster than Japan, you know, all the places that are held out as, as having super fast broadband. Every American has access to speeds faster than the fastest broadband in the world uh, through Viasat. And, and so whenever I hear people saying, oh, but the millions of people who don't have anything at all, um, I just want to point them to the Viasat website. Everybody listening to this, uh, uh, listening to this uh, hangout ought to, ought to click on and see that I'm not making it up. Um, but let me, let me now go to, in our last few minutes, uh, I guess we really only have a couple of minutes, uh, but, but let me ask folks uh, just to comment very quickly in, in, in a minute or two uh, on, uh, and, and to set it up, I'm going to go in reverse order here. So Babette, I'll ask you to go first, uh, and then Daniel, then Rob, and Richard, I'll give you the last word. Uh, and, and the question uh, I'd like you to address is, is to make a prediction, if you will, uh, either of what the court will do or, uh, or make an assumption about what it might do and, and, and what the upshot would be if, if that were to occur. Uh, yes, I think that in, in line... will fail uh, on the basis that's been answered right now. Um, I don't think the court will reach the constitutional issues, and uh, I do think there might be a push then after the fact to move the FCC to reclassifying uh, broadband interconnection as Title II. Daniel? So I am not as confident as I once was that Verizon was going to win this, but I'm still fairly confident. I think that, um, as Babette has pointed out, that the statutory arguments that lost in Comcast have not really been uh, corrected. They were more or less ignored in the upcoming order, in the uh, net neutrality order. And so I don't think the agency has really done enough to satisfy uh, the concerns that the court has had. Now, that having been said, there are two data points since then that are a bit problematic. One is the data roaming order which uh, upheld the FCC's authority to uh, regulate wireless broadband roaming agreements uh, between wireless providers. And the other is the City of Arlington case, where the Supreme Court at least suggested that, uh, sort of as a hint to um, lower courts, that it ought to take agency jurisdictional arguments very seriously. So I, the other half of me teaches administrative law, and I've learned uh, that it's a foolish to bet against the agency in any particular proceeding because of the way the deck is stacked. Um, I think the odds are still uh, pretty good in Verizon's favor, but I don't think it's a slam dunk. Um, but I think what will happen either way is that the court's decision will be a shot across the bow to Congress that it's time for Congress to really settle the question once and for all what role the FCC, if any, should have in regulating the Internet. Rob? So I think the uh, FCC will lose probably three to zero, maybe two to one, but I think three to zero uh, if uh, circuit courts still follow their own precedent and if judges who wrote their opinions uh, follow their own opinions. Um, I think that will be helpful. Um, I, I disagree that the data roaming um, case and the Arlington case are problematic, actually. So uh, data roaming case dealt really exclusively with Title III, the wireless provision. Uh, so it was a 303 and like 316 as well. Um, and uh, then with Arlington, you know, the way I read it anyway, it's pretty plain that um, you know, if 
Congress is ambiguous regarding your uh, jurisdiction, you being an administrative agency, uh, then there's still deference. There, it's, it's still consistent within, within the Chevron case. There's still deference to the agency is determine your jurisdiction if it's ambiguous. But if it's silent, if the statute is silent uh, as to what your jurisdiction is, uh, I don't think the court, uh, the court can say this part, but the, the law didn't change that you can't legislate. An administrative agency cannot legislate and start to conjure up uh, legal powers that didn't have uh, uh, from didn't have given to it by Congress. So I don't think they're problematic. I think um, the commission will lose. Uh, there's some chatter that uh, the commission will uh, try to seek Supreme Court review. Of course, you have to get the Department of Justice's uh, sign off on it, the Solicitor General in particular. And when you lose twice at one circuit court, it does not make uh, for a good Supreme Court uh, case. Um, and uh, Solicitor Generals don't like Solicitor General rather than like to uh, lose. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure that will happen, but maybe there'll be uh, some smoke and activity in that regard. Then, as Rebet said, the, the question does become: Does the commission try to classify for the first time broadband internet access as a title II uh, common carrier service? Um, and it, by the way, there's a myth. This is a whole other conversation, but there's a myth: broadband internet access, internet access of any kind, has never been classified as a telecommunication service. Um, and I'm happy to provide folks with lengthy citations. Um, it's always been an information service, and the Michael Powell Commission just made that more clear with every aspect of broadband. Um, so that, I think, would be devastating to markets and investment. When uh, Julius Janikowski opened up or announced he was going to open up the Title II docket uh, back in May, I wanted to say it was May 5th of 2010, uh, the market overall went down out of the result, the broader market, out of the result of that. But cable and telco stocks went down about double the rate of the broader markets that day. Um, and every analyst uh, who uh, looked at that said it was because the FCC might be economically regulating um, a piece of the internet, the on-ramps to the internet, and therefore opening the door for economic regulation of the whole uh, ecosystem. Rob, thank you. And, and Richard, as I said, we'll give you the last word. Let me play lawyer here for a second, just for the fun of it, give you all a good laugh. That's okay, because lawyers want to play engineer all the, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's just do a little thought experiment and assume that the court finds that the FCC really does have 706 jurisdiction over broadband. Um, but then, you know, what, the, what would have to happen if they had that jurisdiction, the FCC would have to demonstrate that they had identified some sort of impairment to the, to the deployment and adoption of broadband in America that required this particular kind of regulatory intervention. So then the FCC would be in a position where it had to argue, oh yes, broadband is not being deployed across America in a timely fashion, and we need to take steps to alleviate that. But the rhetoric of the FCC over the last four years has very strongly supported the fact that uh, the deployment of specialized services of advanced communications networks of broadband has been proceeding at a really quite lovely pace in the United States. So, well, the the status of these regulations has been in limbo. So they 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 would have to identify a problem that you know that they're solving, and and it's really hard for me to see how these regulations actually do the least thing to stimulate the deployment, upgrade, and adoption of advanced communication services in America. Well, Richard, that's, that's, that's an excellent last word, and I think we're going to leave it there. I, I want to thank uh, you, Richard, Rob, Babette, and Daniel, uh, all four of you for taking this hour to with us today and to uh, lay your thoughts out for where this thing is going over the course of the next week. And, and uh, so there's going to be a lot of attention on this issue. Uh, I understand from what I'm told that we'll likely have a decision uh, in the case, perhaps before the end of the year, more likely in January, and at that point, uh, obviously, there will be even more attention, whatever the outcome is. Uh, the four of you, uh, obviously, uh, know a lot about these issues, and for those who are uh, listening in here, uh, I encourage you to Google uh, all four of our um, participants today uh, and look at what they've written on these issues, and uh, feel free to be in contact with them directly to get their input on things as, as we're going forward. Uh, here at AEI, as I said at the outset, we're going to continue uh, keeping an eye on these issues and, and do so in ever more active way. Uh, keep, uh, keep abreast of what we're doing by following us at 
at AEI Tech, uh, our Twitter handle, and uh, more to come on, uh, in, on uh, our growing activities here at the over the course of the next couple weeks. Uh, again, thanks so much for being with us, and, uh, and uh, we'll do one of these again in the future. Richard, we hope we'll have you uh, in full motion video. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Thanks, everybody.